Good afternoon and welcome again to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. It is good to see all of you. On a, uh, they're, they're renovating this room and it looks really, really nice. So uh, let's uh, thank you guys for being here. I'm Mo Wright, uh, Chair of the Board of Trustees, President Raymond Consultant, and it's good to see all of our friends and new guests here today. Today's forum is a part of our, our Healthy Community Series entitled Heroin's Deadly Presence. It's presented today by CMC and Ohio Health. Today's forum in particular is sponsored by Cardinal Health, Mount Carmel Health System, the Columbus Foundation, and WBNS 10 TV. Each are represented here today by their many associates and colleagues. Please welcome all of our sponsors for today's conversation. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our uh, host for today, one of our sponsors representing Cardinal Health, Betsy Walker, the Director of Community Relations, who will introduce the rest of the forum. Betsy. Thank you, Mo. Good afternoon. Thank you to the Columbus Metropolitan Club for convening this really important conversation. Today we come together to hear some, from some of the very best experts in our community about the ongoing op opiate epidemic. Ohio has the unfortunate distinction of having one of the highest overdose death rates in the country. Cardinal Health, with our global headquarters based here in Dublin, recognizes prescription drug abuse as an epidemic and as a public health crisis, and we are committed to doing our part in the fight against prescription drug misuse. We believe that the responsibility to address this public health crisis belongs to everyone, and the path forward must include a multifaceted approach, of which we'll talk a lot about today. The Cardinal Health Foundation has been committed to preventing prescription drug misuse since 2009 through our Generation RX program in partnership with the Ohio State University College of Pharmacy. As the epidemic evolves, so does the Central Ohio's community work to prevent abuse, help those in need of treatment, and support those who are in recovery. I'm honored today to welcome this esteemed group of panelists to share what is happening here in our community to combat the opiate epidemic and hopefully give us some thoughts on how we can all help. Everyone here has a role that they can play in helping our community and our neighbors. Please join me in welcoming our panel. First, we have David Royer, the CEO of the Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Board of Franklin County. Next, we have Dr. Anahi Ortiz, who is the Franklin County Coroner. Next to her, we have Jim Davis, the Assistant Chief of the Columbus Division of Fire. And on the far right, we have Dr. Teresa Long, the Health Commissioner for Columbus Public Health. <clears throat> Dr. Long, the podium is yours. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. As health commissioner, I'm charged with protecting health and improving lives of the nearly one million residents of Columbus and Worthington. It's an honor and a duty that I take very seriously. And I can tell you that opiates keep me up at night. One need only look at the city at our daily headlines to see that heroin has a deadly presence, a grip in our community. My colleagues and I today come to the table with shared values that every life matters. Every life is worth saving. To that end, we must be grounded in the understanding that heroin addiction is a chronic relapsing brain disease and that and it is causing devastation in vulnerable communities today and has been for a while and will likely into the future. Again, addiction is not a disease of one's character. It is a disease of the brain. And it is a complicated chronic condition. And that means that the epidemic is just as complex. Consider that in the last six months, the average number of overdoses that our area hospitals have seen have jumped from seven to 12 a day. The number of Narcan doses administered by our Columbus EMS has almost doubled, and the number of deaths has increased from one to 1.7 per day. How big is the epidemic? Let me put it in perspective. With respect to homicide, the number of drug overdose deaths is nearly double the numbers of homicides in our city. HIV and AIDS. Even in our worst years of the HIV epidemic here in Columbus, 1992 to 1996, then we had deaths that were ranging from 110 to 150 a year. Opiate deaths today are double and nearly triple that number. 
and infant mortality. In 2015, the number of unintentional drug overdoses was nearly double the number of infant deaths. This epidemic is painful and it's devastating to affected families and neighborhoods and it has become personal for many of us. Every day we are reminded that none of us are immune and all of us will likely be impacted in our own families, in our neighborhoods, our schools, and our workplaces. This epidemic affects all races. It affects all socioeconomic backgrounds and every neighborhood, every neighborhood from inner city to suburb. While this epidemic is challenging and we have a lot of hard work to do, we can be successful. There are no easy or quick fixes. We in public health have made some positive steps already. New is a new comprehensive harm reduction program, SafePoint, with our partners Equitas Health. It is providing clean syringes three times a week to prevent the epidemics of hepatitis B, C, and HIV, but providing, again, access to clean needles, but access also to ready access to treatment and counseling, as well as naloxone. We also have a new 24-7 opiate emergency response system. Anytime there is a surge in opiate deaths, overdoses, or ER visits, 10 agencies are coming together immediately to evaluate what steps have to be taken to further protect our residents. In July of 2016, July the 12th, we had a surge. We didn't have that kind of coordinated effort. We did get together, but now we have a system. So the next time we had a surge, September the 22nd, it was realized about 9 o'clock at night by 11 o'clock. Within two hours, all 10 agencies were together on the phone and quickly protecting and informing our community that fentanyl was present in our community. And we, we believe, I believe, it helped save lives. In public health, we are also committed to further both educate and, and prevent. Education clearly needs to also involve reducing and sharing the impact of the shame and stigma associated with this epidemic. We also are committed to data and co continuing to monitor and share that information about this epidemic in our community and to partnerships and advocacy. We are grateful, and many of you are here, we are grateful for our partner agencies for stepping up in this important issue. I also want to thank our mayor, Mayor Ginther, and our Commissioner O'Grady, and the other county commissioners for their support, too. Public health is not a solo act. It is a team sport, and we are glad they, and we are glad our partners who are here today are on our team. And after today, we hope that you will be on our team as well. It is going to take all of us, all of us here and all of us in our community, working together and digging in to do more than we've ever done before. Ultimately, we can break heroin's deadly grip on our community by helping those who are already addicted to get the help they need and preventing people from becoming addicted in the first place. There is great commitment both here and in this room to this work, and it does start with us. So let's learn a little bit more about what's going on and what we're experiencing from our expert panel. So let me start with just little mini introductions. So Dr. Ortiz, as Franklin County Coroner, you play a critical role. You're given your vantage point. How does your work relate to the current opiate epidemic? <clears throat> so my agency um, is here to investigate all um, violent deaths, which include the overdose deaths. So um, we have seen, as Dr. Long has um, very well um, described, um, a huge increase in the numbers of overdose, uh, overdoses and overdose deaths. Since actually 2012, uh, we've been seeing a high increase. Um, a couple of things. I think for me, what really um, brings it home is about a year ago, we started working with multiple agencies on overdose death review. And one of the agencies was, um, uh, has a gap folder for families who, um, who suffer a loss. Um, uh, their child or, or their relative has died. And we started stocking the gap folders at our front desk. And what I started noticing is, within a week, that pile was gone. Um, and we've had to restock and restock and restock these folders. 
So um, we not only see those who die of overdose deaths, but we also really speak with the families and see the families come into our office and um, see the loss, the devastating loss that they are going through. Thank you. And Chief Davis, as Deputy Fire Chief, whose teams are on the front line saving lives every day in our community, what role do you play in this crisis? Uh, well, first of all, good afternoon, and on behalf of the Division of Fire and the Department of Public Safety, thanks for doing this, and thanks for everybody for being here, um, including us in the conversation. On any given day uh, in Columbus, we are giving the drug naloxone eight, nine times a day now. Uh, last week it was 12. Uh, to reference you, uh, your comments earlier, 2,400 times in uh, 2016 we um, responded to a suspected opiate overdose in the community. We've treated 34-day-old um, children, infants, uh, whose moms were breastfeeding and using, and we've treated 70-year-old pastors at churches. There's no community that is untouched by this. We have identified a couple areas of the city that um, have a higher incident of usage, and we've worked with um, many of our partners in the community, starting with Dr. Ortiz and her group, through the Sheriff's Department, the Columbus Police Department, um, to try to uh, impact uh, that type of um, response to those neighborhoods. Um, it's, it's every day, and, and in some cases, it's two and three times with the same person in a 24-hour period. And every month, we see probably 15 or 20 people more than once in a month, and we've tried to work through the health department and your, and your offices to actually identify those folks at a higher risk and reach out to them and pull them into some type of system for treatment. Thank you. And Mr. Royer, David, we all get to know each other pretty well um, in this work. So what are the agencies, um, I'm sorry, David, I, I, before I want to set the stage. So tell us a little bit about your work and the role of Adam in our community. Well, the Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Board has been um, part of our community for almost 50 years. Uh, we, what we do is essentially plan for, evaluate the needs, and contract uh, for mental health and addiction services, treatment services, as well as prevention services. It's uh, because of citizens like you that we're able to do that because of our levy. We have a 2.2 mil levy uh, that provides us the supports that uh, are required in order to support both people with mental illness as well as addictions. Um, so we've been doing this a long time, and I can tell you um, on a personal level, I've seen it, I've been in this business nearly 40 years, and it has never reached um, the level of distress as a community that I currently see every day. Thank you. So, on to our other questions. Dr. Ortiz, um, clearly you've already made mention uh, of your office and what you have been seeing, but what, can you tell us more about the impact, the workload now, how it's changed over the year or the last six months, and what might be some of the things that you're seeing in your, in your office? Um, recently, I held a, uh, we have quarterly coroner's meeting, and each different uh, department um, brings me their numbers and, you know, what's going on in each department, and um, the, uh, the number of cases that we investigate for overdose deaths, or just in, in general, has truly increased. Uh, so we've seen um, a huge number of increases in the numbers that are investigated our investigators have to go out and investigate, um, which will at some point, we already are pretty fully staffed there, but if this continues, we're going to need to bring in another investigator or ask for more funding for our agency um, to cover the investigations that we go out um, to, unfortunately. Um, our toxicology lab is uh, accredited. It's an excellent, excellent lab. Um, and they are seeing tremendous numbers, um, an increase in the numbers of sam samples that we need to test. Um, we get asked pretty frequently, can you rush them? Can you rush them? We cannot. We have so many machines to work um, the, the cases. 
And again, this may be, um, we're already getting a new machine. Um, this may be a case where we need to bring in another toxicology and some more machinery. So we're seeing an increase in the workload that our office sees, definitely, um, during this period. And we're some of the ones who are bugging her, along with many others, as far as getting more information as quickly as we can. Could you say something, and I think Chief Davis may mention it as well, but perhaps about the changing um, substances that you are finding um, when, you're, when you're doing the deaths and death reviews, mm -hmm. and what that might mean to our community? So about 80%, and it's been pretty steady, 80% of overdose deaths are heroin related. And, it, and that has been now uh, since 2012, 2013. However, fentanyl started coming into the picture in 2014. We saw something in the 20s, uh, the numbers of people who died of fentanyl related overdose deaths. By 2015, we saw 48. Uh, overdose deaths related to fentanyl. Last year we were up to, and this is preliminary number, um, up to about 112. So from 48 to 112 fentanyl related overdose deaths. Those increases started around last summer. We started getting hit, uh, pretty much hit with fentanyl and carfentanyl. Uh, the end of last summer, early, for, uh, early fall, and that has just continued to the point where in January and February, um, my toxicologist sent me an email and said, look at this, this is what I've just screened for January and February, and it was an alarming number. Um, so from January to February of 2017, we've, um, already seen more than, let's see, it's 80, more than half of what we saw last year in terms of um, the fentanyl-related overdose deaths. Thank you. Uh, sobering. So, Chief Davis, you also are seeing this. Uh, so, what have you seen over the past year? What feels like it's different now? How is this epidemic evolving? from your standpoint. So as, doc, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as Dr. Ortiz mentioned, the fentanyl and the carfentanyl has actually kind of put a different spin on this. And the reason is, is because fentanyl has been a medication used for pain management and healthcare for years. So it's not new, but what's new about it is it's being added to these different uh, forms of heroin. So the person who uses a little bit every now and then, and then of heroin, and then has something that's cut with this uh, fentanyl, um, it affects them differently and they're not prepared for it, so then they end up overdosing. So what we're seeing then is it's requiring additional naloxone to reverse the effects of that and then add the idea of the carfentanil and those type of medications. The carfentanil is a veterinary grade pain medication and I'm not talking about for your dog and your cat, I'm talking about for moose and elk and game and big game. So then it doesn't take a whole lot to uh, harm somebody and then it takes more uh, naloxone for us to reverse that effect, and it takes it over a longer period of time. So as an example, naloxone was a uh, highest pharmaceutical expense to the Division of Fire in 2015. It cost about $150,000. Outside of um, uh, normal saline, it was the most frequently used drug. So we're using it more often, we're having to use more of it, and now we're dealing with two issues in the community that with this, these patients are, one, they're wanting to refuse assistance once we wake them up and reverse their effects. They want to just go on down the street. And that's a potentially dangerous situation because that naloxone wears off before the effects of the drug wear off and then they relapse. Second, and second to that, um, you, we have a situation where folks just um, don't realize the impact and the effect of it. And so they're, they're not taking it serious enough that, that they could relapse. So let me just stop because I find all of this sobering. I work with these colleagues all the time. So let me make a plug. Why not carry naloxone? This is something that we are encouraging. We spoke a little bit about where, and again, you can, any of us can go to our pharmacies. Um, no prescription is required in Ohio. We're trying to get that word out to our pharmacists. But indeed, many of us, and now with these newer, stronger, more potent synthetics, 
we may, any of us, be called to try and save a life. Um, and yes, we should always call 911 and they will be coming. And again, Chief Davis and his group and actually all of our emergency responders in this community are amazing. But you too may have the opportunity to save a life. So I would encourage you to join me in thinking, why couldn't it happen to me? Why not in our workplace, in our church, in our school? But again, I would encourage you to consider getting naloxone as well. Um, just had to make that plug. Uh, and I don't work for the company, honestly. Um, there are actually two companies. So with that, David, what are the agencies um, seeing these days that provide treatment? We know that they have been busy before some of this was happening, but obviously we're seeing more people with an interest in moving to treatment. What are the needs now? So what are our, our treatment partners and organizations seeing, and what are the needs now compared to last year? Um, over the last, I want to say about 18 months, uh, the Atom Board, as we're known, um, we've expanded funding for treatment by nearly two, I think it was about $2.2 .2 million um, in a variety of strategies. Uh, one of the things we're working with Chief Davis on is, is having um, drug treatment specialists actually go with the MS on overdoses for motivational interviewing. This is a very tough, tough and difficult population to engage. One of the things I would encourage you to do is think about, if you, if you closed your eyes for a moment and thought about who's an opiate user, um, you're probably right and you're probably wrong. Because one of the things that's very clear is that it is a diverse, diverse population. One of the nuances that we're trying to sort out is what we call multi-generational opiate users. That is fam uh, people that have been brought up through families uh, with, with a history of opiate use or substance use disorders. But we also know that there's a generation of first generation users. Um, a typical story I heard the other day when I was out uh, having some conversations, um, her son was wounded in Afghanistan, came back post-traumatic stress disorder, treated with opiates, now is a heroin user and currently in uh, the VA for treatment. So it's really important that we not um, stereotype in our own heads about who these people are. It's, uh, it's as, different, as diverse as this audience, occupationally. Um, and, but the other thing that's interesting about it is that one of the things through uh, some work we're doing on behalf of the mayor and the, and the board of county commissioners is that um, there's a real gap uh, from a treatment perspective. And that is from the time that, that uh, Chief Davis uh, administers the naloxone to the time that the addict is taken to the emergency room, there's a very short window of opportunity uh, to engage that person. And one of the things that I think more progressive uh, communities are doing that are overwhelmed is what's known as a stabilization center. And what, we want, what we're challenged with is one of our primary uh, tasks coming through this process is how do we have a facility that can take these folks during that window of vulnerability to engage them in trying to motivate them to believe that there's something better than the current state. And we can do that with things like medication-assisted treatment. We've expanded detox. We've expanded community outreach. Um, but again, it, it's a, it's as, the, the challenge for treatment and prevention is as diverse as this community is. I appreciate that. And I appreciate hearing that we're all learning. We're all learning and trying to figure out how can we put things in place. Um, so actually, speaking of both learning, but learning from others. Uh, we've certainly seen Dr. Ortiz in many cities that coroners are being overwhelmed. Um, overwhelmed with the deaths, they're running out of space to place bodies, even bringing in refrigeration trucks when needed. So what challenges, and you've alluded to a couple, but please, could you just share a little bit more about the challenges that are facing your office because of opiate deaths? Um, uh, again, uh, staff-wise, we need uh, more staff. That's that's um, something that's primary right now. Um, testing for the toxicology services um, that we're getting some increase in in, in uh, samples. And uh, the other is um, our office is actually part of um, a opiate crisis task force and. Uh, one of the things we found necessary was to actually apply for a grant, which we were awarded by ODH, 
And um, we now have uh, a grant coordinator that works with uh, the Opiate Crisis Task Force and helps with these issues and collaboration and bringing people together on, on this topic. So um, I think that's, that's a big one is, is that we actually needed to apply for a grant <laughs> to bring money in to help us with this issue and bring in a grant coordinator who can help. So, oh, I thought it was turned off. So clearly there's lots going on and more to do, and, mm -hmm. and you've already made mention the importance of both involving many partners and, and improving or increasing coordination. So Chief Davis, um, as someone who's trained to save lives, what has the epidemic taught you? You, are, I know, are always learning and thinking. What, what do you do in working with your colleagues and the challenges? We know compassion fatigue is something that's coming online, or at least gets talked about. And so if you could talk about that, but also if you could make mention of what does it mean to give people another chance? So I think that the way, the best way to answer that question is that it's a bridge till tomorrow and having one positive thing for me specifically out of this whole crisis has been the ability to um, meet and work with so many good people that are trying. And there's no textbook how to fix this. If there was a textbook, we'd all have it and we'd implement it and that'd be it. But the fact is there's a lot of good people out there and, and just having the conversations um, have helped and have helped the compassion fatigue of waking somebody up three times in a 24-hour period. But specifically, the folks from addiction have taught a lot of us in public safety that it is a relapsing brain disease, that you need to meet people where they're at in their recovery, that you need to understand that um, folks aren't necessarily ready at the moment of their um, event. So you get them health care, you get them dental care, you get them into some type of health care, and then start having the conversation. And so we've been pursuing that with our folks to try to make sure that they understand. And that's been part of the conversation with David Royer's groups and the hospital systems that are here that have been so gracious to work with us on trying to um, find these people and meet them at their time to find out where they're at in their recovery. Because one of the good things that came out of some of the police projects that we've been working on have been that these folks are eloping from the hospital between 60 and 90 minutes from the time that our folks drop them off. So it's important to find them at that point in time, because um, Chief Minor and his group are, are pointing out to us that once they get out of the hospital, they're sometimes hard to find. So I, I hope that answers your question. Well, it does in part, and I would just say, if you don't have a sense of the partnerships that our EMS, Columbus EMS, many of the other emergency responders, together with our Sheriff's Office, our Columbus Police, Everyone's trying to work together to be smarter, to do more, again, to bridge that opportunity to recovery. And I think knowing that it doesn't always happen at the first moment, but sticking with people, as Chief Davis has said. Um, and actually, Chief Davis has been a big part. I know Sheriff Meinert is here, Deputy Sheriff, oops. Maybe Sheriff Baldwin is here too. Um, yes, we love him. Um, but in our Columbus police, they have gone the extra distance. If you don't know, and I, I expect that many of our other uh, municipalities are exploring this, but to basically train up our law enforcement personnel to be able to administer naloxone is remarkable. And actually, Chief Davis, you know a little bit about the numbers as far as what's happened just in our, our short time here in Columbus. Well, in the, in the city of Columbus, under the, under the direction of Council Member uh, Mitchell Brown, he asked that we work with uh, Chief Keegler and the Columbus Police folks on an naloxone program in the community where uh, the police would actually be prepared to administer the drug prior to our arrival. So we identified two areas of the community that were highest risk, one in the south end, one out on the west side, um, of which there's a lot to talk about there because those are the highest areas for infant mortality in our community, for human trafficking in our community, for prostitution in our community. And so I don't think we can have a conversation as a community about heroin and opiate overdose without having a conversation about the social issues in those particular areas. However, the Columbus Police um, did a train the trainer program. We helped them with that. They went back out, they taught their folks 
They've um, administered the medication multiple times. During the trial period, it was, I want to say, 59 times. They had 58 successful resuscitations with the drug. Um, they really knocked it out of the park. They did a great job. And again, it's a bridge till tomorrow. The one person that was unsuccessful was somebody who was already in cardiac arrest. Our experience is that if somebody's heart has already stopped and we get there, they don't do very well. But if we get to them in that window, that four to six, eight minute window between when they stop breathing and when their heart stops, we can get them resuscitated. And that's where the Columbus Police Program comes into play because they're out on the street constantly around in the neighborhoods and uh, they've really done a great job with it. You could also learn CPR as well. That would be oh, a good plug. Great <laughs> point, great point. <laughs> but it's very impressive. And again, our sheriff's department, our police departments are all moving forward in that way. So David, um, Mr. Royer, as the numbers continue to go up and the epidemic evolves, what are the challenges that both Adam and, and others are facing and what barriers to treatment exist and how are we prepared to address them? Uh, I, I think over the last several weeks, probably been part of about 30, 35 different conversations with almost every sector of our community that is being impacted by this. i give you an example. Yesterday, I uh, spoke with Obetz Police Chief and, and Hamilton Township Fire Department. We have deaths in Obetz. We, uh, Hamilton Township went through 30 doses of naloxone in only 41 days. So it's um, one of the things that's really apparent is that um, it is widespread. And the other part of it is timeliness to treatment. Um, the, the reality is, and, and I had a meeting yesterday with some of our treatment providers, and, and we have to do different, we have to think differently um, about time to access. One, when, throughout these conversations that I've had over the last several weeks, um, the thing that is apparent from a treatment perspective, there's, there's multiple perspectives, but the, on the treatment perspective is that there's not um, a place for people that are motivated after a, a near fatal overdose. That has to be addressed. Secondly, time to access has been a consistent um, observation made by regardless of whether the public health officials, police, fire, safety, ER physicians, um, we've done some interesting work through a grant with the Columbus Foundation, with focus groups, with ER physicians, et cetera. So it's timeliness to access. I think the other thing, too, is that a consistent theme that comes across through these conversations is that we also have to understand that if we don't have an upstream strategy on prevention and opiate education with, with the kids as well as the high school kids, um, because there is this factor of intergenerational use, but also first generational use, we need to explore what are those strategies that have to be put in place from a preventative context. And finally, I would tell you that it also is about a community awareness and a community education strategy. Um, we can have um, treatment and we can do prevention, but if we don't educate ourselves at the very person level, about what's helpful, what's not helpful, what they need to understand. Uh, the reality is we're not gonna slow the stream down. Um, regrettably, I was talking to somebody yesterday from an EMS and they said, you know, this may be a new reset, that this drug has now permeated so deeply and across the, uh, the spectrum of our society that we may have a reset on how we think about opiate addiction in America. And I think some of the recent media articles that you can read this morning's dispatch had an editorial about that reinforces the idea that if we don't collectively address this issue as a community, that we will be forced to accept it as a reset. In the community I know of Franklin County, that's an unacceptable reality. Thank you. So a few weeks ago, <clears throat> and it is actually coming right on the... <coughs> Right, right after what <clears throat> David just shared. A few weeks ago, Mayor Ginther and County Commissioner O'Grady brought us together, us, our Franklin County Public Health colleagues, our law enforcement colleagues, our hospital colleagues, health system uh, colleagues, and, and brought us together both to support our work and to plan for what we must do as a community going forward to address this issue. So clearly what David is, is sharing with you is part of this work. So is there something else, David, that you would share um, well, actually, before you share that, 
Timing is everything at this place. So let me just stop for the commercial note that in a few minutes, you too are gonna get to join the conversation. So in a few minutes, please, I'd like you to be thinking of your questions. Um, but as we tee this up, clearly this is about how we move forward as a community. So David, as a, as a final question, are there things that you would share um, coming from the planning work that you and all of us are doing um, that our community needs to do, must do as we move forward? Yes, as she mentioned, um, we're, we're in the process of um, really trying to put together a draft plan for all our, our partners to look at on behalf of the mayor and the county commissioners. Um, but I think what we need to do, and having looked at plans from around the state and around the country, um, I believe that government's at its best when it's challenged to uh, perform and to be accountable for its performance. And so one of the things that we hope to do is produce a plan that our partners will embrace that essentially says we need to move forward in a collective collaborative effort that is measurable um, and that hopefully will produce tangible results for the community. Um, conversations are important, but when people are dying at a rate of 1.7 a day, there has to be a structure of performance and accountability as a public sector uh, collectively towards this problem. So we hope to bring that as well. I think the other thing too, and in conversations I've had with some of our, our corporate leaders, is that uh, this is not um, a public sector problem. This is a uh, community and corporate problem. You employ thousands upon thousands of employees, and yet opiate addiction is occurring inside your employee base. No one is, no one is avoiding that. And so one of the things that I think is imperative is that we also have some kind of form of partnership with our corporate and business community um, so that we can make sure that the efforts that we undertake in the public sector are complementary and consistent with what the employer base is, is seeing and needing. And then finally, uh, in our conversations, obviously one of the ways that we have to work with um, uh, the prevention side is both at a community level, but also at a school-based level. And so one of the things that we're gonna try to do is push for a comprehensive opiate education plan in every school district in this county. So we're getting a little taste of what might be coming all of our way soon. So thanks for sharing that. Now this is your time, um, your time to start to ask these experts um, questions. Um, again, it, you, so if you don't know, the microphone is over here by the banner. Um, it is the Metropolitan Club's tradition to, again, take the audience questions. You would be asked, I would ask you to state your name, your question. We thank you in advance for not making long editorial comments um, because we really would like to have the conversation. So please. Um, I'm Warren Fishman, and thank you so much for coming and giving, having this forum. Um, I, I've heard a lot of conversation, but I haven't heard anything mentioned about the control of opioids as, as prescribed by doctors, and once the prescription is given, the supervision um, that could help addiction. Can we talk more about that, and is, are, are there solutions coming? Can you repeat the last part of your question? I'm sorry. Are there solutions coming? No, right before that. What? Uh, can you repeat your question? The question is that, of course, I've had several back surgeries and some surgeries, and opioids are given as prescription, in a prescription quite freely. And, and, and I wonder if we're doing anything to control that, to change doctors' attitudes about giving opi opioids in the first place, and once they're given, control the, the, the use of them and, and how long people take them and so on. You, want you can or I can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know our governor, Kasich, recently um, is trying to pass a, some legislation for physicians here in Ohio to follow the guidelines that have been set forth by uh, SAMHSA and CDC. Um, if that passes, uh, that will be mandatory, that physicians follow guidelines which do state how long and how much you can give opioids for certain problems um, that patients are having. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that in here in Franklin County, 
our opiate uh, task force worked with emergency room department heads and the four hospital systems um, and Jeff Klingler to come up with a standardized protocol for emergency room physicians and emergency rooms. And that includes the use of opiates in the emergencies, in the emergency rooms by the physicians. So um, each, they signed that, I think it was something in, in December of 2016. So slowly they'll be implementing those standardizations, all four hospitals and all four um, system emergency rooms. So, Hopefully, little by little, you will see uh, a decrease or, or better use of prescribing habits by physicians. And one other note, the Board of Pharmacy does note that the numbers of prescriptions written for opiates by physicians here in Ohio has been decreasing uh, in the last few years, two, three years. So we are seeing a decrease. It's still not enough. I totally agree with you. And, and there are things in the pipeline that are coming. I might just real quickly add two things. One is uh, one of the things that we keep hearing consistently through this process is that we need to uh, work with our uh, dental uh, professionals to make sure that um, not only is it physicians, but uh, that also our dental community understands some of the risks associated with it. Finally, I might mention that um, in Staten Island, New York, they had a very interesting concept about trying to decrease the, the, the amounts of uh, prescriptions. They actually used what they called uh, reverse detailers. If you know, uh, pharmaceutical reps go out to doctor's offices all the time. It's not to challenge the pharmaceuticals. It's just simply to, to try to continually educate physicians on a community level about the risks of prescribing uh, opiates. And they've actually seen a drop through the use of what they call this reverse detailing as a way of constantly reminding physicians that it's a, that it's a challenge. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name's Fred Looper. I have two questions. The first is with the ready access of Meloxone. Do you find that users are more reckless because they know there's something out there that will save them. And the second question is, every day I hear of uh, controlled substances in every jail and every prison, every place. Uh, I know we don't have the right to scanners to do body scan searches and that sort of thing, but can't we keep down the amount of uh, illicit drugs in jails and prisons? Two interesting questions, thank you. So on the first one, do you wanna to speak to the, what do you think the availability of naloxone has done with respect to some persons, um, people who use injection drugs, thinking that they may have a safety net, so to speak? So I think that I think that your question raises an issue that we've all dealt with. Um, we've had internal discussions and pretty healthy debates on the enabling conversation. Um, some will tell you that if naloxone is enabling, it's enabling the person to get to tomorrow where maybe tomorrow is an opportunity for them to get help. Others will say that then oxygen for somebody who smoked for 40 years is enabling them to continue to smoke, or insulin is enabling for somebody who continues to eat unhealthy and has become a diabetic. So, I mean, you can have that debate either way, and believe me, I've been a part of some pretty good discussions about that. The one thing that I would add, though, is that I, I, I took a, um, a gentleman out from one of our local um, uh, businesses here in our community who works within their healthcare setting and he wanted to go out and see EMS in the city of Columbus and we ended up on an overdose and and I spoke to the woman who was with this person that the medic crew was treating and I said do you have naloxone available to you and she looked at me and she said yeah but I've used all three of mine on friends and so it, I, I'm looking at her like th all three I mean so the issue is um, really up for debate, and it's where it sits within your heart, I guess. Thank you. And actually, honestly, as far as the availability and the use of um, um, illicit drugs, or even it could be prescription opiates, but it should be illicit drugs, I think the question was about, I don't think we actually have the right panelists 
to speak. Do you want to speak about it or, or potentially? Oh, sure, you can always talk. The last thing I'll say about that is, the last thing I'll say to that is if, if it were my kid, I guarantee I'd have it. And I think that's what we all come back to. I know we have families in the audience who have experienced this. And if it were my child, I would want everything um, that might be possible to save a life, give that bridge an opportunity for another day, an opportunity for recovery. Um, so next question. My name is Ken Hale. I'm a clinical professor at the College of Pharmacy at Ohio State. And I actually am responding to Mr. Fishman's comment. And um, I just want to make this panel aware and maybe the audience aware that there is a role for the pharmacy community in terms of this epidemic. Uh, as we speak, we are piloting a project called the Opioid Patient Education Program in Southeast Ohio through Kroger Pharmacies in Chillicothe, Lancaster, Portsmouth, Waverly, and Wheelersburg, hopefully that to spread following the pilot. It's quite simple because we know that uh, most of the misuse of these substances starts with prescription drugs, and you know, that, this has been well documented. Eight, 75 to 80 percent of heroin users start misusing a prescription pain medication. So. If we have patients coming to our pharmacies with new opioid prescriptions, can we educate them more clearly on the risks, on how they should be stored, how they should be disposed of? By the way, you can get naloxone in our pharmacy. Our pharmacists in this pilot are doing that systematically, also based on an ORS report, you know, so it's all part and parcel. And then two weeks later, making a phone call follow-up with the patient. Do you have questions? How is it going? If it's a short-term need, maybe it's time to dispose of the drug. So we think that, you know, I would encourage the panel, and maybe I pose it as a question, you know, how can we get all hands on deck in terms of health professionals across the board and include pharmacists, nurses, dentists, physicians? I think we all need to, to engage. But I want to make Mr. Fishman aware of that project as well. Make sure you see me after, uh, after the panel discussion. Um, we need the pharmacists on board, uh, continuing to be on board. Um, that's one of the things that's very apparent, having gone through some of this process, is that it truly is so multidimensional as to, to how this is permeating our, our society, our community. And you're right. Uh, if we can get pharmacists on board, then again, it's, I hate to say it, but it, it's kind of a point of contact uh, kind of reality, and the better we can work with you at point of contact, maybe uh, we can change the uh, trajectory of some of these stats. Thank you. If I can add to that, one thing the Division of Fire has done is we've signed a data use agreement with both public health and with the um, School of Social Work at Ohio State, and we've shared with them all of our opiate overdose data from the last several years with the intent of them teaching a big data analytics class and trying to help us find places within that data to begin making impact. I spoke Monday to uh, the leadership of the university health system, and one of the things that I, I really believe is with this wicked of a problem we have in our community here, we're very fortunate to have the Ohio State University, and the fact is is that the Glenn School and, and the Fisher and your pharmacy school and the School of Social Work and the School of Public Health to actually come together and help us try to figure this out, and I'm happy to talk as soon as Mr. Royer is done with you. <laughs> And I would say that these issues of, are going to be how we support each other, how we learn together. My colleagues, as we continue to talk about the normalization of naloxone, we continue to hear that pharmacists are unaware that you don't need a prescription in Ohio, that yes, they are responsible to do some training. It doesn't have to be huge. But again, these are all opportunities for us to make a difference in our community. So thank you for the comment and the question, absolutely. So indeed, these are challenging times. And this is one of the most complex issues that we have faced. But look at the people here, both here and here. We can. We can all do this together. Uh, we have faced difficult problems before, and we certainly will face them again. So it will take commitment, resources, collaboration, and personal will. So we do need your help. Uh, consider your role coming from today. If you haven't before, please consider your role in this crisis. This problem, like all others before it and those that will come next, can and will be solved, just as we've said, by doing it together. So thank you, and I'll turn it back to Mo. What an important conversation. Let's thank these folks.
We hope you were uh, enlightened by today's conversation. We encourage you to stick around uh, over coffee and cookies to continue the discussion. Uh, please know that all CMC forums can um, be watched through a number of venues, including uh, CTV Columbus Television, on WOSU and PBS affiliates throughout the state, through the Ohio Channel, and of course to the CMC website via YouTube. First, let's thank again our sponsors, Ohio Health, Cardinal Health, Mount Carmel Health Systems, the Columbus Foundation, and WBNS 10 TV. Let's give them a round of applause. And certainly to our speakers today, Dr. Teresa Long, Chief Davis, David Royer, and Ani Ortiz. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next week.